Uh, good morning, everyone, and good evening to those of you who are joining from China. Welcome to the 2021 Harvard Chinese Life Science Virtual Annual Symposium. Uh, my name is Stan Lian. Uh, I'm a member of the HMS CSSA, and I'm going to be the host for today's event. Due to the ongoing pandemic, uh, we decided to host this year's symposium virtually, and we really appreciate all the speakers and audience for attending this event. Next, next let's welcome Dr. Xiaoting Ma, the president of HMS CSSA to give a very brief introduction of our association. Xiao Hello Ting. everyone, I'm Xiao Ting, the current president of our Harvard Medical School Scientists and Scholars Association. First, I would like to welcome everyone for, to participate in our 2021 Harvard Life, Chinese Life Science Virtual Annual Symposium. This is the 11th year of HCLS Annual Symposium and it has become a legacy in the Howard Chinese researcher community. Second, I would like to give a brief introduction of HMS CSSA. HMS CSSA is a non-political and non-profit organization that provides support for the people originated from China who are starting and working at H. Howard Medical School and affiliated institutions. Our organization mainly focuses on promoting and advocating the academic communication and collaboration of Chinese scientists and scholars in HMS. We have organized numerous academic events, such as Distinguished Scholar Club, Scientific Salon, Mini Symposium, to provide an opportunity for scientific communication and networking. In order to assist career development, we invited many HMS Chinese alumni who are working either in academia or industry to share like, their experience and suggestions in job hunting and career transition. We have also collaborated with other student organizations from surrounding universities to co-organize some entrepreneur and venture events to inspire ideas for biomedical innovation. In addition to these academic events, we also have regular social events such as the Scholar Running Club to advocate both physical and mental health of researchers. Especially during the ongoing pandemic, HMS CSSA has assisted many people both in our community and in the Alonwood area by distributing masks and sanitizers. We will keep on working and organizing more exciting events to make a better community. Lastly, I would like to thank all the speakers, our organizing team and audience for coming and I wish you all enjoyed today's fantastic talks. Now I would like to welcome the Dean of Howard Medical School, Dr. George Daly to give the opening remarks. Dr. Daly, the stage is yours. Thank you, Xiaoting. Good morning, everyone, and thank you to the Harvard Medical School Chinese Scientists and Scholars Association for bringing us all together for this 2021 Harvard Chinese Life Science Virtual Symposium. It's really wonderful to be able to kick this off today. And I'm, I'm so pleased that even virtually, um, this will convene so many of us. The CSSA is so important because it strengthens collaborations between US scientists and our counterparts in China. CSSA's promotion of cultural exchange between the US and China and its support for those from China studying and conducting research here at Harvard benefits Harvard Medical School, but also the global scientific community. <clears throat> now, coming together for events and symposia like the one we're kicking off this morning uh, is very, very important for forging critical connections. And in turn, these connections are the foundation for building strong collaborations, which are essential, it, it, increasingly essential in a world beset by global problems. And none of us could have envisioned <clears throat> that in uh, 2021, we'd still be confronting a pandemic of this magnitude and duration which has stretched our healthcare providers to capacity, forced us to ramp down our research labs, have transformed our homes into classrooms, offices, um, and really forced us to reimagine the ways that we socialize, um, we, we, we work, we teach, we learn. So the last year and a half, it has been the most challenging of my career, and I'm sure that many of you are feeling the same. Now, while at times 
leading Harvard Medical School through this global health crisis has been exhausting and deflating at times, no doubt. I've actually chosen to focus on the more silver linings uh, of the past year and a half. Now, chief among them is the spirit of collaboration that I have witnessed across the global medical community, uh, a community that has come together to, to tackle COVID-19. Now, global collaboration was the impetus behind the formation of the Massachusetts Consortium on Pathogen Readiness, or Mass CPR, as we call it. It was launched last March 2nd, uh, 2020, and it um, was, was kicked off at a historic meeting that was held at Harvard Medical School. And I think mass CPR is the blueprint for global cooperation, not just in pandemic preparedness, but in many scientific areas where we have to transcend uh, traditional scientific silos, uh, bring disparate institutions together and really get beyond what are often international political tensions. The global scientific community is a powerful force for diplomacy. Now, Mass CPR was established as a multi-institutional collaboration. It was led by a steering committee. It's been led uh, over the last 18 months by a steering committee of investigators that are drawn from all four Massachusetts medical schools. So Harvard, BU, Tufts, and UMass. Uh, we have representatives essentially from all the affiliated academic teaching hospitals, research institutes. We have representatives from MIT, Mass Life Sciences, and various um, local biopharma companies. Now, Mass CPR then has brought together literally hundreds of researchers, um, clinicians, public health experts, all really rallying together against COVID-19. Now, along this journey of discovery, Mass CPR has collaborated extensively with Chinese colleagues. Now, most of them primarily have been at the Guangzhou Institute of Respiratory Health, and our closest um, colleague is Dr. Zhang Nanshan, who is a renowned physician who has been a very influential leader in Chinese response to the coronavirus. Um, but we've also collaborated with others, other institutions in China and around the globe, most notably uh, in Italy, in Germany, and South Africa. It is important to point out that the insights that were shared from the earliest days of the pandemic by our colleagues in China really taught us how we could learn from one another's experiences and develop refined strategies to combat future resurgences of infection, future pandemics. Now, one of the earliest and most profound insights that came from our colleagues in China was that a quick recognition of a novel pathogen and a rapid coordinated lockdown, really on an unprecedented scale, would actually result in the control of the virus. Now, another really valuable insight came when we observed the healthcare systems, first in China, and then of course in Italy and beyond, we saw them reorganize very nimbly to handle the surge in seriously ill patients. They built makeshift pop-up hospitals with unprecedented speed. And they taught us how we could divert clinical resources and personnel to absorb and manage the surge. And I wanna emphasize, there was an incalculable value of this advance warning to us the, the generous flow of clinical and scientific knowledge from our colleagues in China. They provided us with ample warning of what kind of a tsunami was going to hit us. And I would argue that our collaboration with our colleagues in China really enabled us in New England to prepare for the surge and really to avoid the catastrophic overload of our hospital systems. Now, unfortunately, I think it's well known that the United States really failed to mount a similar coordinated national effort. And some parts of our country didn't even feel the need to, to heed any early warnings from abroad. Now, instead, there were leaders here in the United States that actually chose to ignore the very public health measures 
that had worked so well in China and Italy and elsewhere to bring the explosive virus under control. Our country has paid the price for this. In the past 18 months, they have really been marked by, by tragedy uh, and triumph, by pain and progress, by despair and hope. And I would say as we continue into the second year of the pandemic, we do have some reasons for optimism. The mass CPR played a major role. Our investigators really were central to the development and testing of the Moderna and Johnson & Johnson vaccines. Mass CPR investigators collected thousands of samples, uh, biological samples from COVID-19 patients. And that and um, a number of other basic research resources have provided an incredible wealth of insight um, allowing us to deepen our understanding of how the coronavirus causes disease and how we can fight it. Now, these triumphs of collaborative science extend well beyond mass CPR. Researchers across the globe have selflessly shared information, designed, developed vaccines um, and other treatments at unprecedented speed, all to come together um, against a common adversary. And now we are coming together again with colleagues from across the globe to look at the rise of um, an evolution of viral variants. Now, mass CPR has flourished uh, over the last 18 months, I think largely because of the urgency of the pandemic. And also there was the availability of generous funding and that has actually compelled the participants in mass CPR to shed the competition, the individual priorities, to suppress institutional self-interest, to forge what is really an extraordinary collaboration. And I have to say, I wanna, I wanna hope that we have learned lessons and that we can in the future construct similar organizations and promote the similar levels of, of collaboration so that we can confront other major societal threats, persistent health disparities, racism, poverty, climate change. I really do believe that collaboration, international collaboration is the antidote to even the most virulent future threats. And I cannot overstate the pride that I felt for the contributions of science and my scientific colleagues during this pandemic. So let me pose two questions to all of you who are gathered here today in the spirit of scientific exchange. What productive collaborations have you forged during the pandemic? And what collaborations should be formed to prepare for the next pandemic or to prepare to confront the devastating health challenges before us? Alzheimer's, schizophrenia, autoimmunity, or cancer. I envision a future that is filled with enormous opportunities to work together. It's part of the Harvard Medical School mission to alleviate suffering and improve health and well being for all. Coming together, all of you can achieve a reduction in health disparities, can address the threats of climate change. And it's important, you are the future generation of leaders in science in medicine. <clears throat> we need to train you, we need to train those of you who will follow and stand on our shoulders, just as we, as we have stood on the shoulders of the giants that have come before us. So thank you to the CSSA, thank you for coming together, bringing us together today to advance the spirit of scientific exchange and collaboration. And thank you for supporting our colleagues in China and for this annual event, which paves a path towards creation of our unique global scientific community. Thank you very much. Thank you so much, Dr. Daly. This is truly wonderful opening remarks. And as you just mentioned, collaboration is the key. Uh, so which kicks off today's symposium. Uh, Screen. So for today's event, we're gonna hear 
um, talks from three sessions, two in the morning and one in the afternoon, um, and also followed by the HCLS Annual Distinguished Research Award Ceremony. So please stay tuned for that. Um, before we actually get started, I would like to remind the audience, um, please do not record the symposium on your own behalf. And uh, for each speaker, there are going to be five, 25 minutes of talk and five minutes of Q&A. The moderators will uh, help pick questions from the Q&A box. So please sort of type your questions there. And when you're typing questions, please also uh, address which, uh, which speaker this question is, uh, is, is for. So uh, let's get started with the first session of today, Pathogen Invasion and Host Immunity. We're going to have three speakers. Dr. Judy Liberman is going to be the keynote speaker, followed by Dr. Neil Alto and Dr. Hong Bo Luo. Dr. Luo is going to moderate the first two speakers and I would introduce him as the last speaker towards the end. Okay, so Dr. Luo, please uh, turn on your camera and audio and let's get started with the first speaker. All right, thank you. Um, so yes, uh, our first speaker is uh, a professor, um, uh, uh, Judy Lieberman. Um, so uh, Dr. Lieberman is an endocrine chair in um, uh, cellular and molecular medicine at Boston Children's Hospital. Um, in fact, I can spend uh, more than one hour to uh, enumerate uh, uh, Dr. Lieberman's scientific uh, uh, accomplishments. Um, it's quite, um, you know, uh, you know, uh, un unbelievable. So it's, it's from T cells to NK cells, uh, from DNA uh, exonucleus to um, uh, microRNA uh, RNA different based therapy, uh, from granzymes, perforin. Uh, uh, granulizing to uh, uh, gastamines and from HIV to um, uh, cancer immunology to uh, co 19 So I'm, I'm due to these um, uh, extraordinary achievements, uh, Dr. Uh, Lieberman was elected as a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, uh, the uh, National Academy of Sciences and the National Academy of Medicine. Uh, so without uh, further ado, I, I, I will turn it over to Dr. Lieberman. So the title of, uh, of a talk is uh, uh, Fanning the Flames, uh, Inflammasome Activation and Apoptosis in Severe SARS-CoV-2. Thank you. Um, so I, I really am honored to be asked to give this talk. Um, I've had a longstanding relationship with Chinese scientists uh, since the 90s, when I started collaborating on HIV and helped set up a national uh, AIDS program in China that was funded by the NIH. Um, and the work I'm going to uh, tell you about today um, was actually started, is based on work that was started by three Chinese postdocs, uh, two in my lab. Uh, Jing Lu and uh, Xibin Zhang and uh, Jinbin Wan in Hao Wu's lab. So it, it really the starting start of this was when we identified the molecular basis of in, inflammatory cell death or pyroptosis um, as being pores formed by uh, guest dermans. Can I have the next slide? And today I'd like to tell you about uh, work we've been doing to try to understand uh, what everyone agrees that um, that severe COVID-19 disease is really an inflammatory disease characterized by cytokine storm um, and uh, macrophage activation. Um, the people who get the severe COVID-19 disease who are a minority of infected patients, a couple of percent, uh, are those who have evidence of uh, more basal inflammation or inflammaging. They include older people, people who have uh, the, the comorbidities. And the development of severe disease occurs a few weeks after infection is not really linked to viral load and actually occurs after viral loads have peaked. So even though there's a lot of evidence that um, 
that there's a lot of inflammatory mediators in the blood of, of patients who develop severe COVID disease. And we're going to define severe disease as require as uh, lung um, compromise that requires either intubation or intensive care unit um, care uh, and is sometimes fatal. Um, so even though everyone agrees that there's a lot of inflammation and there are a lot of mediators of inflammation in the blood, we don't really understand the mechanistic basis of what generates uh, that inf inflammation. And what we hypothesized was that inflammatory cell death or pyroptosis would uh, lie at the root of severe COVID disease. Can I have the next slide? Um, so, um, I just wanted to go over briefly a little bit of the, the sort of characteristics of mild versus severe COVID disease. So on the top, <coughs> with mild disease, um, you in both cases, you develop symptoms about five days after you become infected. Um, you start replicating the virus and shedding the virus before you're symptomatic. And in people who have resolved infection, the viral load starts declining after about day four and is non-detectable after uh, about um, a, a week or so after symptoms. Um, and there's inflammation that is detected beginning when you develop symptoms that um, is gentle and resolves and patients recover. On the bottom are the patients who develop severe disease where the viral shedding uh, persists for much longer um, as, and the virus is detected for much longer. But what's characteristic is that the um, amount of in inflammation is much greater um, and those patients start developing uh, pneumonia, shortness of breath and signs of hypoxia about uh, five or so days after they develop symptoms and require admission to the intensive care unit. And the pneumonia uh, goes on into acute respiratory dis distress, um, multi or vascular leak um, because the inflammatory cytokines damage the uh, integrity of the blood vessels. And as a consequence, you get multi-organ failure and can die. And also another prominent feature is activation of neutrophils um, and uh, disseminated uh, uh, coagulation, which is also an important part of disease. Can I have the next uh, slide? Next slide, please. Okay, so um, the, the, our understanding of inflammatory cell death, which is triggered when immune sentinel cells, and we're talking uh, primarily about um, monocytes, macrophages, dendritic cells, but other myeloid cells like neutrophils um, have sensors in their cytosol um, that can sense danger or invasive infection. And when those sensors um, detect um, these signs of infection or danger, they activate the formation of a large complex called the inflammasome. And they recruit an adapter called ASK. Um, and then they recruit the proenzyme of the inflammatory caspase, caspase one. In the inflammasome, caspase one gets activated and caspase one, when it's activated, has two main functions. It cleaves a protein called gastermin D, a gas for gastrointestinal tract, dermin for skin. It's expressed in the immune sentinel cells as well as the epithelia and skin. And caspase one cleaves gastermin D and the N-terminal domain goes on and forms pores in the cell membrane that uh, uh, cause uh, uh, cell death. Uh, caspase one activation also causes the processing of precursors, proenzymes of, uh, of the IL-1 family, 
and those mature IL-1 family proteins are secreted and they're very potent mediators of fever and other signs of inflammation. The uh, chemokines are re re uh, released, they recruit immune cells to the site of danger or infection and uh, greatly potentiate the immune response to infection. Can I have the next slide? Uh, so um, as I said, a, a number of papers have shown that there's um, a lot of signs of inflammation uh, in, in the blood of patients who go on to develop severe disease. Um, but if you look at... If you look at Mark, uh, Neil, you might want to mute. If you look at the markers that are characteristic of uh, hyroptosis or this inflammatory cell death, um, they are elevated. Gestermin D on the top left. Um, IL-1 is not detected because it's such a potent cytokine. It's uh, removed from the blood very rapidly, but the antagonist of IL-1, which is a surrogate for IL-1 activation, is elevated uh, compared to healthy donors. That's HD in, in those graphs. Uh, L18, another IL-1 family cytokine, is elevated, as is LDH, which is released from pyroptotic cells. And the levels of, of these mediators, um, if we look on the bottom, and compare patients who go on to have mild disease, don't need to be hospitalized, moderate disease or severe disease show that the inflammation is greater in the uh, severe disease. Can we have the next slide? Um, so um, as part of this work, we uh, hooked up with a, a molecular epidemiologist named Stephen Bell at the University of Cambridge and we asked him um, if he could look at genes associated with inflammation and uh, whether or not uh, small um, mutations in, in those genes that are linked uh, to increased expression might be linked to the development of severe, uh, severe COVID disease. And he, he uh, looked at data that's available online uh, where which compared about 4,000 people who developed severe COVID disease with hundreds of thousands of, of, of patients who did not. And the top gene um, that had a link of increased expression, these are called EQTLs, these uh, genetic mutations of which there were three uh, for gastermin D was strongly and significantly uh, linked to the onset of severe disease. There was also a significant link to two inflammasome genes, NLRC4 and NLRP3, and a suggestion of a, hang, of a link to the IL-1 receptor, um, type 1, uh, IL-1 receptor uh, receptors. Uh, so what this suggested is that people who have genetic uh, mutations that overexpress this uh, inflammatory pathway may be more prone to severe COVID disease. Can I have the next slide? Um, so uh, we wanted to look in the blood to see if there was any evidence of uh, inflammasome activation or inflammatory cell death in circulating blood cells. And to do that, we, we needed to use fresh uh, blood cells. And I think that's part of why uh, this have, hasn't been discovered before, because mostly people were looking at uh, frozen or fixed cells. Um, because when you freeze and thaw uh, cells that are dying, they don't, they don't thaw and that you lose them. Even activated lymphocytes get lost in this process. So when we looked at whether um, blood cells were dying. And we did that by staining with a fixable dye called zombie, which you can think of as, as like a propidium iodide. And another dye called the Nexin, um, which um, stained cells undergoing classical pyroptosis. What we found is that only one subset of cells in the blood, namely 
the monocytes, which are these myeloid sentinel cells, um, had evidence and were looking at healthy donors uh, uh, flow cytometry in the top and a COVID-19 patient in the bottom. And the COVID-19 patient on the extreme left, you can see increased zombie staining, uh, but no increase in an excellent staining. So this suggested that the, their monocytes were undergoing an inflammatory necrotic type cell death, which could be pyroptosis. And th this is just quantified on the right, where you can see about over 10% of, this is all COVID patients, not just um, severe patients, had evidence of uh, uh, in undergoing inflammatory death. And this is amazing because usually in vivo, it's almost impossible to detect dying cells. Can we have the next cell, next slide? So to look at whether the, this inflammasome might be activated, uh, we stain for the adapter ASK uh, in red for activated caspase one by an enzymatic assay called FLICA. And we look compared healthy donors in the top uh, images to COVID-19 cells in the bottom. And um, basically what we found was that in, in the healthy donors, the adapter protein for the inflammasome was spread throughout the cytosol. But in the COVID-19 patients, you see these puncta, which are called these red puncta, which are called ASK specs. And if you look at the membrane of the COVID-19 uh, monocytes that have the aspects, you see the characteristic ballooning membrane morphology of pyroptosis. The cells that had ASK specs also had evidence of uh, uh, focal uh, sites of caspase one activation as you would get in the inflammasome and they co-localize, which you can see in panel C. And we didn't see, um, if you look at the graphs below, say on the, on the extreme left, we didn't see cells um, that were fresh monocytes that had ASK specs in healthy donors, but uh, in, the, in these samples, about 3% had um, ASK specs in their monocytes. And if we stimulated a pyroptosis with a, 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 a ionophore called niger, nigericin, which activates the NLRP3 inflammasome, you could see that we could stimulate some of the monocytes of healthy donors, but many more of the uh, COVID-19 infected patients. Can I have the next slide? Next, we wanted to see what inflammasome uh, might be activated. So we stained the cells for three inflammasomes, NLRP3, which senses uh, cell membrane damage, uh, which you might get with a lot of infections that are cytopathic. Uh, AIM2, which recognizes DNA in the cytosol where it shouldn't be, so it's a danger signal and pyrin, which recognizes uh, metabolic effects of uh, toxins. And so uh, pyrin, and so these inflammasome proteins are normally uh, distributed throughout the cytosol, as you can see with the pyrin staining in both the healthy donors on top and the COVID-19 patient, patient cells on the bottom. Uh, but we found cells with, uh, as, with as, specs that co-stain for NLRP3 on the, in, on the left uh, panel and AIM2. And uh, these specs co-localize with ASK and they also co-localize with each other. So um, NLRP3, AIM2 and ASK, ASK all uh, co coalesced into large micron size um, specs in monocytes. And in, in these experiments, about three or 4% of the monocytes had, um, had uh, aspects that co-localize with either uh, inflammasome. Can I have the next slide? 
And then we wanted to see, you know, when you activate the inflammasome, you can, you can cause this inflammatory cell death called pyroptosis, but under some circumstances, the cells repair the membrane damage and survive. So we wanted to know, are the monocytes actually dying? And to do that, we looked at um, uh, what was happening to gastermin and dye uptake, uptake again by imaging flow cytometry. And what we found is that uh, the amount of gastermin in healthy donors was, was, uh, was here on, on the left western blot. There was uh, almost no evidence of gastermin cleavage, which is required for its activation. Um, and we stained for actin as a control, but it turns out in pyroptosis, actin gets fragmented and can be uh, degraded. So in the COVID-19 uh, samples, we found either no um, evidence of full-length gastermin left or cleavage, um, and uh, my, mitochondrial protein COX-4 was used as a loading control because actin uh, was not a good control. And then when we looked at the monocytes from healthy donors on top, COVID-19 on bottom, what we could see again is uh, no ASC specs in the healthy donors. Uh, the gastermin was disseminated throughout the cell, but in the COVID-19 patients, we found that the as cells that had aspects had uh, relocalization of gastermin into membrane associated puncta, which is um, a hallmark of poor formation. And on the right, at the, in the COVID-19 patients, you can see that the cells that had the gastermin puncta also had uptake of zombie dye. So these monocytes not only formed inflammasomes, but they actually were dying of inflammatory death and spewing out all kinds of inflammatory mediators. Next slide. So we next we wanted to know what activates the inflammasomes in the monocytes. Monocytes don't have um, the ACE2 receptor for uptake of uh, the SARS coronavirus. Um, but we thought, well, Let's look anyway. And it turned out that um, the cells that, um, if you look at the imaging flow cytometry images on, on the left, the healthy donors, and we stain for um, two measures of <clears throat> COVID-19 infection. Um, we stain for the nucleocapsid N in red or for double-stranded RNA that gets formed when the virus starts to replicate with an antibody called J2, also in red. And what you can see is that the cells that had ASC specs were infected. They had uh, not only nucleocapsid, which you could stain for with passive uptake of the virus, but they also stained for um, double-stranded RNA suggesting that the virus had started to replicate. And there was basically a one-to-one -one correspondence, which the graphs show, between um, uh, nucleocapsid or J2 staining and the presence of ASC specs and vice versa. So basically, every cell that had an uh, inflammasome was infected, and every infected cell formed an inflammasome. Can I have the next slide? Um, Next slide, please. Um, and when we looked in the lungs of autopsy specimens, we, we also found, um, uh, and we compared patients who died of COVID with trauma patients, we looked and stained for infection here and nucleocapsid is in green, aspects are in red. And we looked at both the macrophages staining for CD14 in the lungs and the CD14 negative cells, which would be lung and epithelial cells mostly. And what we found is that the, the cells that had the aspects uh, also stained for CD14, whereas the infected epithelial cells, we did not detect aspects. So if you look um, at the graph in panel K, 
what you can see is that of the ma macrophages in the lung, the CD14 positive cells, about 8% um, uh, were infected, but a higher pr proportion, almost 25%, about 25% um, contained evidence of inflammasome activation. The number of lung epithelial cells that were infected was higher, but we didn't detect any ASC specs in those. So both blood monocytes and tissue macrophages appear to be infected. Can I have the next slide? Um, so because monocytes and macrophages don't express the, the ACE2 receptor, you wanted to understand how did they get infected? Are they really replicating the virus and do they produce infectious uh, virions? Next slide. Um, so uh, what we did uh, was take healthy donor monocytes um, and, and determine whether they could be infected with a molecular clone of the virus that expresses neon green when the virus, only when it replicates. And we found in, in our normal healthy donor cultures, we found some cells like type one um, that had no staining for the virus, either for nuclear caps that are neon green. We found monocytes that stained for nuclear capsid um, and had aspects but weren't uh, didn't seem to be replicating the virus or didn't express neon green. And then we found cells that expressed neon green had aspects and uh, nucleocapsid. And we found similar results with staining for double-stranded viral RNA with anti-J2. But the infection only occurred in the presence of either uh, anti-spike antibodies to, uh, that recognize the spike protein on the virus or in the presence of patient uh, plasma, but not healthy donor plasma. And, and if we took that plasma and depleted immunoglobulins with protein AG beads, we got almost no infection. This result suggests that infection of monocytes was mediated by optimization of the virus by anti-spike um, antibodies. Because when we depleted, because we needed plasma, and if we depleted the antibodies, we did not get infection. Can I have the next slide? So um, we wanted to see what was the receptor that um, was responsible for uptake. And monocytes have uh, several, uh, FC receptors on their surface um, that uh, bind to uh, immunoglobulin and could be responsible for uptake of the virus. And so here in this experiment, um, we inf again infected healthy donor uh, monocytes in the presence of COVID patient plasma, uh, but incubated the virus with antibodies or the cultures with antibodies to uh, the FC receptor CD16, which is present on a, uh, activated monocytes in the blood, uh, another FC receptor called CD32, ACE2, the canonical uh, receptor for the virus, and another protein CD147, which has been implicated in uh, viral uptake. Uh, and we also, again, uh, repeated the depletion of antibodies uh, from the COVID plasma. And what you can see is that the only uh, blocking antibody that blocked infection was the um, antibody to CD16, which uh, there are increased cells in COVID patients that are CD16 positive monocytes. It's interesting that uptake of antibody um, by CD16 increases by about tenfold if the antibody lacks a fucose on its FC uh, region glycosylation site. And there have been several papers that have shown that COVID patients during acute infection have uh, increase in a fucosylated antibodies that would be much better for uptake of CD16. 
Okay, so, um, and then we wanted to see, does the virus uh, replicate in, in monocytes as we we've shown two two pieces of evidence so far the staining for the double stranded rna with j2 as well as the uh, expression of the uh, neon green reporter in the healthy donor experiments but the vi we wanted you know more conclusive evidence and what we did is look for when the virus replicates it makes a number of um, subgenomic transcripts, which we could detect by uh, PCR uh, in the middle panel or by gel electrophoresis. And in the uninfected healthy donor monocytes, we didn't see any evidence for subgenomic uh, RNA being produced, but we found the expected bands uh, in the COVID uh, infected monocytes for the sub subgenomic RNA. And then we, we looked at whether remdesivir, which um, in, inhibits um, the viral RNA dependent RNA preliminase, a uh, polymerase or camistat, which inhibits ACE2 dependent entry could inhibit infection of healthy donor monocytes and only uh, remdesivir did. Uh, so this is again, further evidence that the virus is actually replicating and that uh, entry is not by ACE2. Can I have the next uh, slide? However, when we looked at whether the supernatants of these infected cells contained infect infectious virus, they did not. Um, and that's shown by a plaque forming assay where we could, and when we set up the cultures, we could detect the virus that we added for the infection. But after 48 hours, we detected no infectious virus. And we use Vero cells, which are infected by, via ACE2 as a positive control. So what we think is that the virus starts replicating, but probably pyroptosis occurs before the virus can complete its life cycle. So it aborts the infection. Can I have the next slide? Um, uh, let's skip this. It's too uh, for time. Um, and I'd just like to summarize that what, we've, what we have evidence for is that blood monocytes and tissue macrophages can become infected by the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Um, they not only take up the virus passively through antibody-dependent uptake, mostly by, by the FC receptor CD16, uh, and not by the ACE2 receptor. And once they're infected, they activate uh, several types of inflammasomes to trigger um, the processing of inflammatory mediators as well as their release and inflammatory cell death. But the infection is aborted and probably by pyroptosis, although we don't have uh, formal evidence of that. And, and what's amazing is that a large fraction of the blood monocytes, about 10%, which would amount to about 100 million cells at a time, are dying and spewing out all these inflammatory signals. Um, and also um, about 25% of, of the lung macrophages are doing the same. We showed some evidence that patients with severe COVID-19 disease have more evidence of ongoing inflammatory cell death and inflammatory uh, mediators in their blood. And um, there, so uh, Hal Wu and I uh, identified an inhibitor of, of uh, pyroptosis <laughs> of poor formation called disulfiram, which is an approved drug for alcoholism. And we, we hope, <laughs> that it may, by blocking inflammation, have a, a beneficial effect on preventing severe COVID disease. And there are two clinical trials that are in process, one of which is now analyzing all the data, and we'll see very soon. I think one of the um, sort of 
uh, important con um, uh, conclusions might is that since uh, inflammation might be mediated by antibody uh, uptake of uh, opsonized virus, there are certain circumstances where antibodies might be harmful. Um, and we really have to look at that in more detail. But what I've heard is that the antibodies generated by the mRNA vaccines are are not a fucosylated, so they will not be efficiently taken up by um, the monocytes and cause infection. Um, but what we found is that uh, pyroptosis is probably a double-edged sword in SARS-CoV-2 infection. It leads to the production and processing of, of uh, inflammatory cytokines and release of inflammatory mediators and likely is a, a contributor to uh, severe inflammation. However, pyroptosis also prevents this huge population of infected myeloid cells from producing infectious viruses. Can I have the next slide? This work um, took a lot of people. Um, it's it's, it's under review in nature, it's online in uh, Research Square. Uh, you can read about it if you'd like. Um, and the people who, were, a, a lot of people contributed, a lot of the people that Dean Daly was talking about in mass CPR helped get us clinical samples, gave us antibodies, gave us reagents. Uh, we use the BL3 laboratory at the Reagan Institute, but the main leaders of this research were Carolyn Junkera and Angela Crespo in my lab and Shaheen Ranchbar in my colleague Ann Goldfeld's lab. Thank you. And I'd be happy to take questions. So, okay, so I'm looking at all these uh, questions. Uh, Sending in. So because of time constraints, we can only do uh, uh, maybe two questions. Okay, I'm sorry uh, if I, I went over. No, no, that's fine. So the, the, the host just <laughs> noticed me. <laughs> that's fine. So, but I, I, I actually went through some of the questions. Uh, in fact, I believe many of them uh, has been answered by uh, uh, Dr. Lieberman uh, because it was uh, sent in uh, uh, early. So I will pick a couple ones. So, Okay, so this one from QI. So great talk. Uh, recently, there's a paper on uh, immunity show some other receptor uh, other than ACE2 uh, can bind uh, spike protein to help a COVID uh, virus into monocytes. Do you think that might be a way to active uh, GASMD uh, pathway independent of uh, antibody? Uh, uh, we've looked at some of the other receptors. We didn't find any evidence. And, you know, the truth is depleting the um, immune IgG um, virtually prevented infection. So I, I think there may be other receptors that are active. I don't know if they're expressed on monocytes or macrophages, um, but... Um, I don't think they're going to be the dominant receptors. Right. So uh, another question from uh, Mao Lu, kind of related uh, with just uh, you just uh, discussed. Uh, he asked, "Do uh, keep moving? Do the uh, vaccinated people have more um, paptosis, paptotic monocytes, since more antibodies are produced?" We haven't looked at people with breakthrough infections. So, you know, the people who were vaccinated, only a very small minority are becoming infected. But the, uh, our evidence is that the, the antibodies or the evidence of, of, of other people, which is unpublished, suggests that the antibody generates. So, the, the antibodies that are most effective at uptake by CD16 have, lack this fucose. And it turns out that 
not a lot is known about what is responsible for generating fucosylated versus afucosylated antibodies. Mm -hmm. And it seems like um, when that infection with an envelope virus like SARS can lead, lead or influenza or Zika can lead to afucosylated antibodies during the acute infection. But uh, the mRNA vaccines don't seem to do it. Um, so I think that it, and also it's unclear, but there's some evidence that suggests that the afucosylated antibodies are only produced during the acute immediate infection and they disappear uh, over time. So I think it's unlikely, but we, we're looking at that more actually right now. Mm -hmm. So Judy, I have a very quick question. Sorry, uh, host. So I believe in one of your slides, you show that a gasoline D mutations are associated with the severity of COVID-19. So well, the, yeah, what type of mutations are they? Yeah, so they're, they're not like mutations in the, they're, they're called EQTL. So I never heard of them before either, but <laughs> they are, uh, SNPs, small, you know, single point mutations that are often not in the coding regions. These are not in the coding region of the genes. They're in enhancers, so they could actually be even far away or promoters usually, and they affect the expression of the genes. So that they've been, uh, these SNPs have been, you know, clearly identified as leading to more expression but they don't change the function of the protein. Okay. Thank you, Julie. All right. Okay. Okay. Uh, thank you so much for uh, the earlier two speakers. And thank you, Dr. Lohr, for moderating the two speakers. And actually, it's my uh, honor to introduce you as the last speaker for this session. Uh, Dr. Hong Bo Luo is um, currently a professor of pathology at Boston Children's Hospital. He received his bachelor degree in molecular biology from Nankai University, China. Uh, he conducted uh, graduate research with Dr. Melissa Moore, at that time an HHMI investigator at Brandeis University. After he did his postdoc training with Solomon Schneider at Johns Hopkins, he was recruited to Harvard Medical School as an assistant professor of pathology in 2004. He was promoted to associate professor in 2010 and full professor in 2018. Uh, he's going to uh, talk to us today about neutrophils in host defense and inflammation. Without further ado, let's welcome Dr. Luo. Um, first, thank the organizers uh, for the invitation. So um, I will switch gear to talk about um, another cell type in host um, immunity, so neutrophils. Uh, so neutrophils are the most abundant white blood cells in um, human uh, in circulation. So. Uh, they are generated in the bone marrow and then mobilized to the circulation. So during infection, so they are recruited to the infected um, uh, tissue to um, kill and digest in the pathogen. However, so enzymes and the react, reactive origin species, RS, uh, can also uh, um, cause tissue damages. So neutrophils, they, they are short-lived, so that uh, dead neutrophils are uh, recognized and cleared by both professional and uh, uh, non-professional uh, phagocytes. So uh, a variety of cellular processes such as phagocytosis, chemotaxis, you know, uh, polarization, and ATPH oxidase activation, a release of antimicrobial factors, deregulation. So they are not all required for neutrophils to kill invading pathogens. However, exaggerated neutrophil um, recruitment or hyperactivation neutrophils also cause tissue damage. So the goal of our research is to understand the uh, signal networks that control the production, so the granulopoiesis, trafficking function, and fit, including the death and clearance of neutrophils. So during infection and uh, inflammation here, um, I'm going to discuss several examples and to um, elucidate how these uh, cellular processes are tightly controlled during infection and the inflammation. So first, neutrophils are generated in the bone marrow. And uh, so we know during infection, large number of neutrophils are recruited. So the bone marrow need to make more neutrophils to compensate this loss. So this is uh, uh, known as emergency granulopoiesis. 
So besides the cytokines, chemokines, and um, as well as certain like uh, uh, pathogen derived PAMP molecules, so we found uh, OS also uh, plays a role in this process. So the hydrogen peroxide level increased uh, significantly in the bone marrow during acute inflammation. Actually, most OS are produced extracellularly. And uh, in the bone marrow, we know uh, GL1 positive cells, uh, uh, many neutrophils, um, uniform, uh, uniformly localized. And almost every CKID positive uh, amount of the progenic cells are in close proximity to uh, at least one bone marrow neutrophils. It turned out the, the cytokines, chemokines produced during infection can stimulate these bone marrow neutrophils and it will produce a large amount of OS, which in turn uh, promote proliferation and differentiation of bone marrow myeloid progenitor cells leading to uh, accelerated uh, granulopoiesis. So when neutrophils are mat become mature, they mobilize to the circulation. So this is also tightly controlled by cytokines, chemokines. And we know neutrophil mobilization can be uh, uh, triggered by CX CXCR2 uh, ligands such as KCM2 in mice, so which are produced at a, a very early stage of um, uh, in infection. Uh, and um, so that, that trigger fast neutrophil mobilization. So another cytokine, GCSF, is produced uh, um, later and can trigger slow neutrophil mobilization. So um, interesting, we also find this GCSF can actually uh, inhibit KCMIP2 induced fast neutrophil mobilization by negatively regulating this CXCR2 uh, uh, signaling. So this provides a mechanism for fine tuning neutrophil mobilization uh, during infection and uh, inflammation. So of course, neutrophil trafficking, next neutrophil trafficking and function also controlled by uh, you know, intracellular signal networks. So this is a um, pathway we have been studying for more than a decade, the pathway mediated by uh, first of all, in three, four, five, P3. So P3 signaling in neutrophils can be triggered by growth factors or chemokines uh, through receptor tyrosine kinase or g protein coupled receptors. And this pathway plays a critical role in our uh, chemotactic migration, um, OS production, survival, and phagocytosis. So we know P3 is um, uh, produced by PI3 kinase using PI345, uh, PI45 P2 as a uh, substrate. But its level in the uh, membrane can also be regulated by a lipid phosphatase called P10, which is a three phosphatase. It can convert uh, PI345 P3 back to PI45P2. So based on the study done in digital stadium, it was uh, believed, it was thought, so P10 by uh, regulating uh, P3 um, uh, production in chemotaxin cells plays a critical role in directional sensing in um, a chemotaxis. But when we disrupted P10 in uh, neutrophils, but we didn't see any defect in uh, chemotaxis, and these neutrophils still know where to go, and they show the normal directional sensing capability. In fact, um, due to uh, upregulated P3 signaling, actually these P10 deficient neutrophils showed um, um, enhanced actin polymerization, RS production, phagocytosis, bacterial killing and they are more sensitive to chemotaxin stimulation, and they, uh, they also show improved survival. So clearly, so in this time-lapse video, you can see these small P10 deficient neutrophils um, are polarized compared to wild-type neutrophils after chemotaxin stimulation. So this P10 deficient neutrophil, they're just more active, they're just more active. So, um, PIP3 level in the plus membrane can also be regulated by another lipid phosphatase called SHIP, which is a 5 phosphatase, uh, which can convert PI345P3 to PI34P2. So different with what we observed in um, 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 P10 deficient neutrophils. Uh, so indeed, so this um, uh, SHIP um, uh, deficient neutrophil show drastic chemotactic migration defect. So this is knockout, this uh, wild type. 
So a 10 out shape can regulate the production of P3 in the basal membrane of chemotaxin neutrophils in the absence of shape to the level of this P3 increased uh, significantly, which caused a very, very tight cell adhesion and uh, 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 chemotaxin migration defect. In fact, this defect can be rescued by simply reducing the uh, cell adhesion. So in actually in suspension, we, uh, there's no difference between wild type and a shape deficient neutrophils. They both nicely polarized. However, this is a wild type uh, neutrophils in suspension polarized, but after cell adhesion, uh, yeah, so in this case, uh, this cell still uh, it, 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 uh, maintain, uh, remain polarized, and they start to do this random migration. But this is a shape deficient neutrophils polarized in suspension, but after the adhesion to the surface, it lost the polarity flag and they cannot migrate that. But in fact, in vivo, uh, due to this upregulated um, PIP3 production in the basal membrane, so in fact, the, the, the neutrophil transendocelial migration was uh, enhanced in this uh, shape deficient mice. So we can see this, uh, uh, enhanced the transendocelial migration in this uh, mouse, uh, muscle, mu uh, muscle model clearly. So, you know, besides this uh, lipid uh, phosphatases, the P3 signaling can also be regulated by inositol phosphates. So um, we know uh, P3 exerts its function by recruiting a set of pH domain containing protein from the cytosol onto the plus membrane. So where these uh, proteins get activated and initiate downstream signaling. So uh, these two uh, cytosolic inositol phos uh, phosphates, um, IP7 and IP4, combine to the same pH domain. So therefore, can uh, negatively regulate this P3 signaling. So this um, uh, mechanism uh, was first identified in the Stillium, and then the Snyder lab uh, uh, demonstrated uh, that. So this regu regulatory mechanism also plays a role in insulin signaling and glu glucose hemostasis in the membrane system. And then later we are uh, confirmed in neutrophils. So the PIP3 signaling can also be uh, regulated by IP7 and, and IP4. So here, I just want to uh, focus on IP7 and the enzyme making IP7 in uh, neutrophils, IP6 kinase. So similar to what we um, observed in P10 deficient uh, neutrophils, the IP6 kinase 1 deficient neutrophils also showed uh, elevated PIP3 signaling, uh, the RS production phagocytosis capability, bacterial killing capability. But we also observed some differences. So for instance, so in P10 deficient mice, neutrophil recruitment to the inflamed site uh, was actually uh, elevated uh, in both a proteinitis model and in the pre master muscle model. But we couldn't see any difference in the IP6 cancer 1 deficient mice compared to wild type mice. So at that time, we didn't think too much. We thought, okay, this, this distinct effect you know, may just be caused by different temporal and spatial regulation of PTIN and uh, IPCC kinase 1. Because they're just you know, two different enzymes. In fact, we know PTIN activity is uh, upregulated and IPCC kinase 1 activity uh, is downregulated after chemotraction stimulation. So we just, you know, we went ahead to uh, examine the role of IPC kinase 1 in a bacterial pneumonia model. Uh, so the knockout mice showed um, elevated host defense, um, uh, less lung uh, injury and uh, uh, improved survival after a E. coli challenge. And we also observed reduced the neutrophil uh, recruitment in the knockout mice. Of course, at that time we thought, you know, that's um, that's what we expected because you know uh, uh, improved host defense, uh, less bacteria left, and um, uh, less as uh, uh, chemokines that can produce. Of course, uh, reduce the neutrophil um, uh, uh, migration. But then we measured the level of cytokines, chemokines in, in inflammatory lungs. There's no difference between wild type and knockout mice. And we also uh, you know, use another lung inflammation, inflammation model. So LPS induced acute lung injury. So there's no E. coli, live E. coli in this uh, system. But we still saw this 
uh, reduced neutrophil uh, um, recruitment, um, you know, uh, less lung damage, uh, improved survival in the IPC kinase one knockout uh, mice. We also did this adopter transfer experiment. Uh, uh, basically, we mixed it wild type and IP6 kinase 1 uh, deficient neutrophils together and injected them into the same uh, recipient mice. And then a challenge this mice with E. coli, and we measured the recruitment of these two neutrophil population and exactly the same environment in the same recipient. So in this setup, we could not see any difference between wild type and IP6 kinase 1 uh, deficient neutrophils. In other words, so the reduced neutrophil recruitment observed in the IP6 kinase 1 knockout mice was not intrinsically uh, 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 caused by IP6 kinase 1 in neutrophils. So what happens? We uh, tested many um, well, hypotheses uh, to make a long story short. So, so it appeared, uh, so this neutrophil uh, recruitment defect uh, is actually due to IP6 kinase 1 disruption in platelets. So we know platelets can form aggregates with neutrophils. We call it um, you know, neutrophil platelet aggregates, MPA. And we also know MPA formation can uh, promote neutrophil recruitment in inflamed lungs. So, but uh, which, uh, as we can see here, so the IP6 kinase 1 disruption in platelets, but not in neutrophils. Uh, can significantly suppress the, the, the MPA formation both in vitro and in vivo in uh, you know, uh, inflamed lungs. So mechanistically, we uh, 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 you know, demonstrated that IP6 kinase 1 in platelets uh, can regulate, can control the production of uh, inorganic polyphosphate uh, um, you know, by platelets. And this poly-P, can uh, promote MPA formation and neutrophil uh, recruitment in inflamed lungs by upregulating this brand canyon uh, pathway. So at least in this uh, bacterial pneumonia model, so what we show here is that when IP6 kinase 1 is inhibited, so due to upregulation of people signaling neutrophils, so the bacterial killing capability of neutrophils uh, is elevated, enhanced. On the other hand, due to IP6 kinase 1 uh, disruption in platelets, neutrophil recruitment to the uh, inflamed lungs uh, is suppressed. So this may contribute to less lung damage. So then the last step, the neutrophil deaths. So neutrophil, uh, they are, are terminally differentiated and uh, have a very short lifespan. So the daily turnover of neutrophils is 0 0.8 to uh, uh, 0.8 to 1.6 billion cells per ki uh, kilogram body weight. Uh, based on the most recent uh, report, uh, the half-life of human neutrophils in circulation is only 18.5 hours. And we know neutrophils plays a critical role in inflammation or resolution, neutrophil hemostasis, and uh, uh, in the production of neutrophil extracellular traps, NETs. So clearance of uh, neutrophils, dead neutrophils by bone marrow macrophages uh, can regulate the size and function of the bone marrow uh, hematopoietic needs. So while the uh, while clearance of um, uh, you know neutrophil, dead neutrophils by tissue macrophages can um, trigger directly. Uh, trigger anti-inflammatory responses. So neutrophil death is a key component in innate immune uh, regulation. So we know neutrophil they die even in the absence of any stimuli. So that's why this type of uh, death also called neutrophil spontaneous or constituted death. It's a heterogeneous process. We can see this um, shrinking cells with condensed nuclear sign of uh, apoptosis. We can also see this uh, swelling cells with this uh, diffused uh, nuclear uh, uh, staining signs of um, lytic uh, cell deaths. So we know neutrophil deaths can be uh, regulated by a variety of intracellular and extracellular um, uh, factors. And we found, so lysosomal membrane permeabilization, LMP, plays a central role in neutrophil deaths. So in fact, uh, in neutrophils, LMP, LMP uh, mainly refers to the uh, uh, 
premium violation of neutral field granules. So we can see these um, uh, 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 ruptures on these uh, damaged granules in this EG neutral field in this EM image. So in healthy and um, uh, young healthy neutral fields, of course, all the granules, uh, granule proteins are stored in these intact granules. But in aging neutral fields due to LMP, so these proteins are released from the granules to the cytosol. So one of the protein called uh, acetylene proteins called protein 3 cleaves and activates CASP3 leading to um, apoptosis. Another, um, uh, another um, uh, protein, also a serum protein is uh, called neutrophil elastic elim, cleaves uh, gastamine to generate a gastamine, the uh, antiminal uh, gastamine, gastamine uh, as uh, elaborated by uh, Dr. Lieberman. So this uh, uh, antiminal fragment of gastamine D can form pores on the plasma membrane leading to uh, peptosis lytic uh, cell death. So during all these years, we identified multiple mechanisms that can, uh, you know, control neutrophil survival, neutrophil death. So recently, we uh, conducted a screening. We tried to block all these uh, known pathways and see how much we can uh, prolong neutrophil survival. From this screening, we identified a treatment, uh, clone G treatment. So it's a um, cocktail containing. Um, you know, caspase inhibitor, LMP inhibitor, antioxidants, uh, necroptosis uh, 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 inhibitor, and the GCSF. So the clone G uh, treatment can uh, significantly increase neutrophil half-life from uh, less, or less than one day to more than uh, five days. And uh, a clone G treatment does not um, uh, affect neutrophil function. So the treating uh, neutrophils can still fibrocytose, uh, produce ROS, uh, kill bacteria, and kill attacks as efficiently as uh, untreated uh, fresh neutrophils. And um, so we know uh, neutropenia and the neutropenia, uh, neutropenia related infections are the most uh, important, um, uh, those limiting toxicity in patients receiving chemotherapy, radiotherapy, woman transplantation, of course. We can use antibiotics to treat um, infections. We can also try to increase uh, neutrophil counts in those patients by treating them with GCSF, but not all patients um, respond to these therapies. An alternative strategy would be neutrophil transfusion. They don't have enough neutrophils, then we give them neutrophil. But this practice is also hampered by short ex vivo um, uh, you know, shelf life of the collected neutrophil transfusion products and the rapid in vivo death of uh, transfused neutrophils. Because we know, I mean, uh, clone G treatment can uh, you know, improve neutrophil survival. We wonder whether we can use clone G to uh, improve the efficacy of neutrophil transfusion. So then we uh, first we set up this uh, mouse neutrophil transfusion model. So we induced neutropenia using a commonly used uh, chemotherapeutic um, uh, a drug, uh, cyclophosphamide. Uh, and then we challenge this neutropenic mice with um, E. coli. Again, we use a bacterial pneumonia model, and then we transfuse, uh, transfuse neutrophils into this uh, challenged neutropenic recipient mice. So indeed, uh, mice uh, uh, received neutrophil transfusion showed uh, much improved host defense. And in this experiment, we transfused G treated three-day-old neutrophils together with untreated fresh neutrophils into the same recipient mice. And as we can see here, actually these clone treated 3D old neutrophils were recruited to the inflamed uh, um, uh, lungs as efficiently as uh, the untreated fresh neutrophils. In fact, this uh, 3D treated um, you know, 3D old neutrophils, they lived much longer actually compared to this untreated fresh neutrophils. Uh, consistently, so the mice uh, that received clone treated 3D old neutrophils, they showed um, um, you know, um, enhanced host defense and better survival compared to the mice received um, fresh, untreated fresh neutrophils. So all these um, uh, results tell us, so this clone treat treatment could be a, a promising uh, uh, you know, a strategy uh, to improve the, uh, uh, the, the neutrophil transfusion outcome. 
So till this point, when we talk about neutral field function, neutral field uh, recruitment, we consider them to be, uh, as a homogeneous uh, cell population. We know this is not true. Um, uh, so the different subsets of neutral fields were identified based on their uh, proliferative uh, capacity, uh, phenotypic profile, uh, tissue localization, effect function, site of the origin, and, and the maturation status. So a recent study also suggests that neutral fields can acquire distinct phenotypic and functional properties in different tissues. So, so we tried to understand this neutral field uh, heterogeneity. So recently we uh, collaborated with uh, uh, Chen Li's lab at the Peking U University, and we did a, a single cell uh, RNA uh, analysis and constructed a single cell resolution neutral field transcriptional landscape. So we focus on neutral fields in the bone marrow, uh, peripheral blood, and spin. We identified eight major uh, neutral field subpopulation, so which um, uh, which are you know defined by, by their distinct uh, molecular signature. So basically, G0 to G4 neutral fields are mainly in the bone marrow, re representing neutral fields at different uh, maturation um, uh, differentiation stages. We also identified three uh, peripheral blood mature neutral field uh, subpopulation A, J5, A, B, C. And uh, actually, G5, G5B uh, neutral fields, the highly expressed interference stimulated genes. ISGs. And this, in, uh, very interesting, this ISG expressing neutral fields are highly localized in the subcapitular region in the, in the spleen, and their number increase uh, drastically during infection. And this population exists in both humans and mice. So in a recent study, so it was shown that the frequency of this ISG expressing neutral fields uh, actually uh, increased significantly in uh, uh, patients with mild to moderate COVID-19 compared to healthy uh, individuals, but it remained low in patients with a severe COVID-19. So uh, accordingly, it was um, speculated that this may contribute to uh, the, uh, 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 the lack of interference response in these severe COVID-19 patients. So now we review the molecular signature of this uh, eight uh, neutral field subpopulation, but still, uh, still some key questions need to be answered. For instance, what are the dis distinct function of these uh, you know, neutral field subpopulations and what caused this neutral field heterogeneity? And more importantly, is the alteration of neutral field he heterogeneity related to any uh, diseases? So in fact, from our, uh, our perspective, um, so understanding neutral field heterogeneity um, can also help us to design better and, and more efficient strategy to control neutral field function and, and, and recruitment because different neutral field subpopula subpopulation may respond and behave differently. So as an example, so this is the uh, expression of the receptor for GSSF, um, uh, cytokine, which plays a critical role in granulopoiesis, uh, neutral field maturation, differentiation, uh, mobilization, and survival. So clearly, GCSF receptor is differentially is expressed in different neutral field subpopulations. In fact, many downstream signaling molecules are also differentially uh, expressed in different neutral field subpopulations. So no surprise. Then we measure the, the expression of genes related to a, a variety of neutral field functions. And the functional score, um, um, the, the neutral field functional scores are affected uh, by uh, GCSF receptor disruption differently in different neutral field subpopulations. So all the, this result tell us when we try to um, uh, control neutral function, neutral recruitment by manipulating uh, the related signal uh, pathways, we have to consider the neutral field heterogeneity because different neutral field uh, subpopulation may respond differently to this uh, man manipulation. So I'll stop here. So here are uh, the people who did all this work and thank you uh, for your attention. I'll take some uh, questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, Dr. Luo. Um, I think we, for the sake of time, we'll probably do like one or two questions. So there's one question from the audience. Uh, 
I think it's going to be like a little bit clarified on the interferon responsive genes like ISG. He's asking, is it ISG 15 or other ISGs? Oh, okay. That's a good question. So in fact, it's a, it's, it's a set of ISG genes. Um, so I would say maybe 60% of ISG genes. So definitely it's not all the ISG genes. But of course, it's, it's definitely more than one or two uh, uh, ISG genes. So that's why. So that's we. Uh, that's why we, we feel so. So that response is not caused by, or maybe that uh, mice um, was infected by something. So that no, it's it's different. Those set of ISG genes is different from what we saw. Let's say in uh, E. coli uh, or, uh, or you know the the uh, fungal infected mice. So it's different. It's a, that's a unique set of ISG genes. Yeah. Okay. Um, I actually also have a question for myself. So I think the, the, the data that you showed on the different subsets of neutrophils is extremely interesting, but I don't know if you have done the experiment in which you treat them with the cocktail that you mentioned earlier that prolonged their survival. Um, are those subsets, uh, I'm not sure if you guys ever done it to treat the cells with the cocktail and see um, is there differential survival benefit uh, within the different subsets of the neutrophils? Very good question. We are doing that now. We are doing that now. I think the initial results suggest that I think maybe all three um, populations uh, can be affected by that treatment. Yeah. So we are still doing that. Yeah. Okay. Great Great. Question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much for the uh, speakers and the Q&A discussions in the first session. So um, we're running a little bit over time. So maybe we'll do like a two to three minute break and let's come back at uh, 11.05. Um, and for the uh, speakers of the next session, if you would like to maybe test share your screen and make sure that we are gonna run this smoothly. And he's currently the William Bosworth Castle Professor of Medicine and Professor of Immunology at Harvard Medical School. And he's also a director of the Center for Virology um, and Vaccine Research at, at Harvard Medical School. And Dan's group has made significant contributions to vaccine development, including the vaccine against SARS-CoV-2, the single dose Johnson Johnson, which I assume that the many of you have got that as well. And without further ado, and let us welcome Dan to give us the keynote speech um, titled COVID-19, Developing a Vaccine During a Pandemic. Dan, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much for that kind introduction. Uh, let me share my screen. Uh, let's see. Can you see my screen and can you hear me okay? Yes. Yes. Okay. Well, first, I got to get back to the beginning. Okay. Um, okay, so thank you everyone and good morning. It's a pleasure for me to be here today. And um, what I'd like to do in the next 25 minutes or so is to really give you a whirlwind tour, almost a personal journey that we've had over the last 18 months on COVID-19 and our attempts to contribute to controlling this pandemic through vaccine development. I'll make uh, some comments about vaccines in general. We are studying all of the vaccines, but I'll concentrate my comments today on some of our contributions that led to the J&J uh, &J vaccine. The story starts, as you know, in December 2019. A new disease emerged in Wuhan, China, a pneumonia of an unknown cause. On January 10th of this year, the SARS-CoV-2 sequence was released by the Chinese researchers. On that day, there were 41 cases and one death. I remember that distinctly because that was actually the day of the annual Baruch Lab retreat. And we were discussing uh, within my group this outbreak, and we decided on that day that we needed to make a vaccine. Just think about that. A year and a half ago, 41 cases and one death were sufficient to trigger vaccine development in hundreds of laboratories across the world. A year and a half later, instead of 41 cases, we have 228 million cases. And instead of one death, we have 4.6 million deaths. It's truly astonishing how a viral pandemic can bring the world to its needs. But the scientific community has responded in terms of unprecedented advances in virology, immunology, therapeutics, public health, and also vaccine development. 
The WHO has estimated that there have been over 200 serious independent vaccine programs for COVID-19, spanning all known platforms, including DNA, RNA, protein, vectors, and activated viruses, et cetera. I would argue that the timeline to show clinical efficacy and even initial deployment is actually not the most relevant timeline. The most relevant timeline is a timeline to produce and deploy billions and billions of doses of vaccine worldwide so that every person in the world who wants the vaccine uh, can obtain it. So far, we haven't achieved that. We're doing comparatively well in the United States with three vaccines approved for emergency use. The mRNA vaccines from Pfizer, which is now fully approved, as well as Moderna. Uh, and those were the first two vaccines that were used and uh, deployed and uh, the, the ones used most extensively. The third vaccine that was approved was the J&J ad vector vaccine. Um, and that is also being used quite widely now. The COVID-19 vaccine field took a giant leap forward on November 9th of last year, when Pfizer first announced results from their phase three trial showing very high level of efficacy uh, for their COVID-19 vaccine. Just a week later, Moderna announced efficacy of their vaccine, and at the end of January, J&J &J announced efficacy of their vaccine. There have actually been five large phase three trials in the United States. The two mRNA vaccines from Moderna and Pfizer were the first ones out of the block and the ones that were first deployed. The AD26 vaccine from J&J &J was the next one, and then the CHAD-OX1 vaccine from AstraZeneca and the protein vaccine from Novavax have also shown efficacy and are not yet approved in the United States. The AstraZeneca vaccine, of course, is approved elsewhere. Vaccine development for a new pathogen usually takes many years, if not decades. So how is it possible that not one, but multiple COVID-19 vaccines were developed in a year? It's truly unprecedented in the, history of, in, in the history of science or the history of medicine or the history of vaccinology. Were these vaccines rushed? I would actually argue that these vaccines were not made in a year, but rather these vaccines were made over decades because these vaccines reflect decades of advances in virology, immunology, and the development of gene-based vaccine platforms. And the gene-based vaccines is what has led to both the mRNA and the vector-based vaccines, which are essentially all the vaccines that are given in the Western world now. Clinical trials um, were done quickly because these vaccine platforms were already tested for other pathogens. And development of act activities were performed in parallel rather than in series with a substantial high level of tolerance of pro programmatic and financial risks given the global urgency, but importantly, no compromise of patient safety or regulatory integrity. We first developed the AD26 vaccine platform uh, in, the, in the early 2000s, not for COVID-19, of course, and not for any coronavirus, but rather as part of our HIV vaccine program. So this is the first paper published in 2007, reflecting several years of work in which we uh, did initial cloning vectorization and selection of the AD26 vaccine for our HIV vaccine program through a rigorous uh, a program of uh, uh, comparing different uh, adenovirus vectors for various technical parameters. And then we used the AD26 vaccine first in animal studies and the first in human clinical trials for our HIV vaccine program. Now, this is really another lecture on a completely different topic, but I'll just suffice to say that if it weren't for our HIV vaccine program, there would be no AD26 vaccine today because the platform technology would simply not have existed. We first used AD26 for a pandemic response in 2016 for the Zika virus epidemic. And together with our industry partner, J&J, &J, we produced an AD26 Zika vaccine. This is a phase one, two study in about hundred individuals in which we showed that a single shot of the AD26 Zika vaccine raised neutralizing antibody responses in essentially everyone. Um, and these responses uh, after a single shot vaccine were durable for more than a year. A second shot of the vaccine on day 57 raised titers to much higher levels. So the AD26 Zika program showed the potential of a single shot vaccine and also showed that a second shot uh, would raise these responses. So if we fast forward now to January of 2020, we reasoned that an AD26 vector platform might be able to contribute to the global response to COVID-19 uh, because the, this replication incompetent common cold virus vector was already developed for multiple other pathogens, such as HIV, Zika, Ebola, and RSV. 
As I mentioned, the Ad26 HIV program was our initial development of the Ad26 platform technology. The Ad26 Zika vaccine demonstrated the potential of a single shot vaccine. J&J &J then developed an Ad26 Ebola vaccine, which is now licensed in Europe, and showed that mass production on global distribution was feasible. They're, they developed formulations that could be stable at four degrees in liquid form without the need for a sub-zero frozen cold chain, which was critical for distribution of the Ad26 Ebola vaccine to Central Africa. So this, this vaccine platform has a proven ability to be stable and to be distributed to remote areas of the, of the, of the planet. And the Ad26 RSV vaccine uh, has been administered down to infants down to four months of age. So we thought this vector platform um, was worthy of ex exploration for COVID-19. So this is what we did. So on January 10th of this year, um, as soon as the Chinese researchers uh, released the virus sequence, we started working on it that same night. We did sequence comparisons and we uh, developed candidate synthetic antigens. So when we got back to the lab on January 13th, we were ready to order synthetic genes and start the design process. By the end of January, we signed a collaboration agreement with our industry partner, j, &J. They were the natural partner with whom we worked for AD26-based HIV and Zika vaccines. In February, we started pilot studies immunizing small and large animals. And by the end of May, we had our first publications on natural and vaccine immunity, not for this vaccine, but uh, just general principles of natural and vaccine immunity in non-human primates. And we hope that this knowledge uh, would benefit uh, the field as a whole. By the end of July, we started our phase one, two clinical trials, and we also published uh, the proof of concept showing ad 26 vaccine protection in, in non-human primates. This then led two months later on September 21st to the initiation of the single shot phase three trial. And two months after that on November 16th, initiation of the two shot, uh, the, the two shot version of the vaccine uh, phase three trial. By the end of January of 2021, interim safety and efficacy data were announced for the single shot study, which led to FDA emergency use authorization at the end of February. And during the rest of this calendar year and next year, J&J is committed to producing and deploying uh, between one and two billion vaccine doses worldwide. And I'll just show a few slides from a couple papers that are highlighted across, uh, along the way. So this is the, the paper that we published in July demonstrating proof of concept that the single shot AD26 vaccine um, uh, protects against SARS-CoV-2 challenge in uh, rhesus macaques. Uh, this is a challenge study in rhesus macaques uh, using the model that we had developed in an earlier study. And um, uh, sham control animals are on the left and the vaccinated animals are shown on the right. And these are viral loads in lung and bronchoalveolar lavage. All the sham animals were infected by this challenge and the vaccinated animals were very well protected. In nasal swabs, uh, we also saw very good protection by the vaccine, although there's always more breakthroughs in nasal swabs than in, in lung. In this study, we also looked at immune correlates. We actually tested not just one, but we tested seven different versions of the vaccine to pick the best one for clinical development. And some of the versions of the vaccine actually didn't work very well. So we had a nice diversity of outcomes in, in which to do this early immune correlates work. And we observed that the pseudovirus neutralizing antibody titer uh, inversely correlated with peak viral loads uh, following challenge at week two and even better at week four here in bronchoalveolar lavage, as well as not shown here in nasal swabs. So this is one of the early uh, demonstrations of immune correlates, and we reasoned that if this uh, were generalizable to other vaccine platforms and also held true in humans, then this would be a very valuable addition um, uh, uh, to the clinical development field. So uh, the phase one, two studies were conducted very quickly after that and are published in these papers. And I'm just gonna show uh, a couple slides of the initial immunogenicity in humans. This is a study in about 800 individuals that were randomized into five different groups. Placebo, a single shot of the five times 10 to the 10th viral particles, two shots of the five times 10 to the 10th viral particle dose, a single shot of the 10 to the 11th viral particle dose, and two shots of the 10 to the 11th viral particle dose. The different doses really didn't make much difference. The single shot vaccine raised neutralizing responses in most individuals by week four and in all individuals by week eight. The, the two shot version of the vaccine after the boost on day 57, uh, then there was a three to fourfold increase in antibody titers by day 71. So remember this number threefold uh, with a boost at a two month interval, because I'll come back to that later. 
In addition to the antibody responses, this vaccine also raised robust CD4 and CD8 T cell responses in the majority of individuals. And our opinion is that the T cell responses also are important uh, contributors to protection. So the efficacy study was enrolled at a remarkable pace between September and December of last year. This was a study that was fully enrolled by December in 44,000 individuals worldwide, a one-to-one -one vaccine placebo randomization, testing the single shot vaccine at a dose of five times 10 to the 10th viral particles in the three main geographic areas, in the United States, in South Africa, and in Latin America, including Brazil. Something incredible then happened during the course of the phase three trial. And I think the last, uh, uh, the, the last talk from Dr. Liu described it very clearly, the emergence of variants uh, of concern. The D614G variant emerged um, uh, last year and replaced the Wuhan population. And then there wasn't a lot of variants that occurred until last fall. And then we've seen the rapid emergence of multiple variants that in some cases are more easily transmissible in some cases more pathogenic, and in some cases can partially evade neutralizing antibody responses. And, there, and those are the ones that, we concern, that we're most concerned about for impacting vaccine efficacy. So if we look at South Africa as a case in point, um, the vaccine was designed here and the trial started here in September. During September and December, there was a complete replacement of the viral population by the so-called beta variant, which used to be called B1351. And this beta variant is still uh, the, the variant that probably uh, is the most resistant of neutralizing antibodies. So the efficacy collection period was here in December and January, and uh, is really quite extraordinary that we designed a vaccine here and it was tested against essentially a complete replacement by a highly resistant variant. So we were concerned whether we would see any efficacy at all given this uh, epidemiologic change. Uh, this study was conducted in multiple countries at the time of peak global surge, including in Brazil that had 70% of the P1 and P2 resistant variants, and in South Africa that had over 95% of the viruses, the highly resistant B1351 variant. Despite this challenging epidemiology, there was still robust protection against symptomatic infection, 72% in the US, 68% in Latin America, and 64% in South Africa. The protection against severe disease was 85% globally, and uh, there was complete protection against hospitalization and death in this study. This is uh, the Kaplan-Meier curve of protection against severe infection. The placebo curve is in orange, the vaccine curve is in blue. You can see they separate around day seven. So something happens really, really fast that gives early onset of protection. This is seven days after a single shot vaccine. It's pretty amazing in my view. And this is the time before any detectable neutralizing antibodies are, are, before there's any neutralizing antibodies detectable. So something other than neutralizing antibodies is mediating this early protection. And I think Pfizer and Moderna see a very similar early separation of the curves in their studies as well. This led at the end of February to the emergency use authorization. This was the third COVID-19 vaccine for the United States. The Pfizer and the Moderna vaccines were already in widespread use at that time, but we thought that a third vaccine with somewhat unique properties would be a valuable addition to the vaccine campaign in the United States and particularly throughout the world. A complication arose, as people probably are aware, in early April, there was the observation of very rare but potentially severe uh, thrombosis. And there was a pause of 10 days in the rollout of this vaccine that allowed the regulatory authorities of the CDC and FDA to do a deep dive uh, to basically investigate whether this truly is a very rare event or whether that was just the tip of the iceberg. Thankfully, it does um, appear that it's a very rare event, about two to three in a million cases. Um, and also uh, the pause allowed um, uh, time to inform the healthcare community of the appropriate treatment for this type of thrombosis involving uh, non-heparin anticoagulants because of platelet factor four positivity. And then the CDC did a completely independent analysis that demonstrated that the benefits of the vaccine overwhelmingly outweighed the risks uh, and the vaccine was restarted with no restrictions. How about coverage of variants? Um, we heard some very nice data in the previous talk of the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. Uh, with a J&J vaccine, uh, there is also uh, an impact of variants, as you might expect. So we looked here uh, on day 57 and day 71 following vaccination of uh, neutralizing antibody coverage against different variants. 
And we can see here uh, titers against the parental strain, the Washington strain, the D614G strain, the alpha B117 strain, the so-called epsilon Cal20C or B149 strain, the gamma P1 strain, and the beta B1351 strain. There's about a three-fold decrease of new titers to the P1 strain and about a five-fold decrease to the B1351 strain. These are binding annualized by ELISA. There's about a three-fold decrease, so slightly less uh, to the P1 and B1351 strains. And when we looked at FC functional antibodies, uh, antibody-dependent cellular phagocytosis, antibody-dependent neutrophil phagocytosis, antibody-dependent complement deposition, and antibody-dependent NK cell activation, and there was only a marginal decrease to the B1351 compared with the parental strain. So it appears that um, the variants differentially impact different types and functions of the antibodies. When we looked at T cell responses, then we saw some uh, pattern that was very different. Uh, both CD8 and CD4 T cell responses were essentially invariant and really didn't care about the variants. So the T cell responses, both CD8 and CD4 T cell responses were essentially unchanged for the different variants. So this study demonstrated that neutralizing antibody titers were reduced about five-fold to B1351 and threefold to the P1 variants. There was less of an impact of variance on binding and FC functional antibodies, and there was really no impact of variance on CD8 T cell responses. The fact that we already knew that the I26 cov 2 s vaccine provided clinical efficacy against these variants in South Africa and Brazil, uh, but yet here we show that there was a sub substantial decrease of the neutralizing antibody titer, then it really implies one of two things, either very low and even undetectable levels of neutralizing antibody is sufficient for protection, which seems a bit implausible to me, or it implies that other antibody, other immune functions, such as FC functional antibodies and or CD8 T cell responses might be able to contribute to protection, at least in some cases. And that is supported by some non-human primate studies that we've published that I don't have time to review today. So the next question is durability. Uh, and we've heard a lot about durability of all the vaccines recently. So we conducted a study in which we followed our first 20 patients in our first phase one study in Boston for a period of eight months. And this was published uh, in the New England Journal um, about two months ago. What we found is that there was uh, very good durability at eight months uh, for both uh, binding antibodies shown in the upper left, neutralizing antibodies shown in the upper right, and CD8 and CD4 T cell responses in the bottom. In fact, the antibody responses were only about two-fold reduced at eight months compared with peak, so really quite remarkable durability. There were three individuals that showed a sharp increase of responses during this time period. One was a COVID breakthrough case, and two actually received mRNA vaccine boosters uh, after the Pfizer Moderna vaccines were authorized and before the J&J &J vaccine was authorized. So these data really suggest two things. One, that the durability of these responses is really quite good. And number two, that, that the ad 26 cov 2 s vaccine primes well for any subsequent re-exposure to antigen. If we look at neutralizing antibody titers, we actually saw something that was quite interesting. Shortly after vaccination on day 29, there was actually a substantial suppression of responses to the different variants. Here you can see on day 29, over a 13-fold reduction of new titers to the most resistant B1351 variant, such as actually the majority of individuals have undetectable titers. Also substantial suppression to the gamma P1 variant, and here the delta B1617.2 variant. By eight months, then we saw something quite different. The parental strain uh, only had about a two-fold reduction of titer compared with one month, so good durability against the parental sequence. But we saw that the variant responses essentially came up, and in some cases came up in a substantial way compared with day 29. So it suggests that uh, there is some expansion of neutralizing antibody breadth over time, even in the absence of boosting. So this study shows that ad 26 cov 2 s induced uh, I, I would call it a moderate uh, magnitude of antibody responses, as well as fairly good T cell responses. But importantly, these responses showed minimal decline for an eight month period. The neutralizing antibody response to variants, including Delta, appear to increase over time, suggesting B cell maturation, even in the absence of boosting. And this is, this, these kinetics really contrast with the mRNA vaccines. And I think we saw some of those kinetics nicely portrayed in the previous talk. 
the, the mRNA vaccines after the boost give uh, very high initial antibody titers, but then these titers decline quite quickly and quite sharply over four to eight months. So it's really a very different kinetics. And of course, this leads to the question of boost immunizations. I'm not going to address that too much, uh, but obviously that's a topic of uh, major discussion. So how about real world efficacy? The ad 26 cov 2 s has been tested in at least four real world efficacy studies, including this one in South Africa, which is called Sisonki. And this was the initial rollout of any vaccine in South Africa. Uh, about half a million healthcare workers were enrolled and received this vaccine. And this real world efficacy study um, last month uh, was reported to show that the single shot vaccine provided over 90% protection against death and 71% protection against severe disease and hospitalization in an exceedingly challenging epidemiologic set setting, which is the, the, the uh, deadly Delta surge in South Africa. So how about uh, boosters for the J&J &J vaccine? It's been a topic of uh, substantial discussion uh, in the biomedical community as well as in the, in, in the lay media. This is a study not from our group, but from J&J. &J. This is a follow-up of their phase one and phase two clinical trials. Uh, so there's two observations here. So first, in over 100 individuals, uh, they also see very good durability over time. So here, these antibody responses are followed over a six-month period, and we really see no evidence of decline over six months and only minimal evidence of decline here in this study over six months. So this really uh, confirms the data that we reported in the New England Journal a month prior uh, in a very small number of individuals. This is now in a large number of individuals. The second observation is that uh, after a booster dose at six months, the antibody responses really shoot up very high. One month after the boost, there's already a high response that's nine times higher than the day 29 response. We used to call the day 29 response peak, but it actually might not even be peak. But the day 29 is a time point in which we measured efficacy for the phase three studies. So after the one week after the boost, there's nine times the antibody response of the day 29 responses. And not shown here, if we actually wait until four weeks post boost, it's actually 12 times higher. So, um, so there was really robust boosting potential uh, with a second dose of the J&J &J vaccine to levels that were really about 10 times higher than what was achieved with a single shot vaccine. So that really brings us uh, up to date, which is the most recent data that was announced, which was the two shot vaccine study. So this is a phase three study that has been going on intensively ever since November, hasn't been talked about too much because there wasn't much to say until literally a few days ago. So this was a phase three randomized double-blind placebo-controlled trial of the two-dose version of the J&J &J vaccine. The target enrollment was 30,000. It was a one-to-one -one placebo uh, vaccine randomization. And it tested two shots of the vaccine at five times 10 to 10 viral particles spaced by two months, week zero and eight. And if you recall, the week zero eight interval gave about a three or four-fold increase in antibody titers. I just showed you that if we delay it instead of two months to six months, we actually get a 10, a nine to 12 fold increase in antibody titer. Uh, so, so we think that the two shot regimen is beneficial with a boost at two months, but it's even better if you wait until six months. And this study was global in the United States and Europe, uh, in Latin America, South Africa, and Southeast Asia. And the results that were announced on September 21st show that the efficacy of the two-dose vaccine is substantially better than a single shot of the vaccine. And the point estimates uh, showed a 94% point estimate of protection against any symptomatic disease in the United States, 75% protection against any disease globally. And we think this reduction reflects the resistant P1 variant in, in Latin America and the resistant B1351 beta variant in South Africa, which were major sites of uh, and, and major contributors to the endpoints of the study. But importantly, there was 100% protection against severe disease. So really, uh, these efficacy numbers are substantially higher than with a one-dose vaccine. And I think these, these efficacy is really uh, very, very good. 
So where are we with this vaccine? So the efficacy was demonstrated in, in two global phase three studies, as well as in at least four real world efficacy studies, including long-term protection against the Delta variant in both the United States and South Africa. I didn't have time to share the real world efficacy studies, but there's about an 80% protection against severe disease and hospitalization with a single shot vaccine against the Delta variant in the United States. The, uh, we think the single shot vaccine is a very good choice for individuals and or countries that want a simple, convenient, rapidly acting and broadly um, administrated uh, vaccine that requires no sub-zero freezing cold chain and also has proven durable efficacy. We think this will greatly accelerate the mass vaccine campaign. If individuals or countries want a vaccine with exceptionally high efficacy, then now we have evidence that the two-shot version of this vaccine provides very high efficacy. Uh, and, the, and this is when the second shot is given at two months. But we also think that based on immunologic criteria, that a late boost at six months will actually be even better than the early boost at two months. The role of this vaccine is in progress in the US and globally. And, um, uh, as people probably know, there have been some uh, manufacturing challenges, but now manufacturing is uh, 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 ramping up very considerably at multiple sites throughout the world. And um, over 15 million Americans have received this shot, 25 million people in the US and Europe, and over 100 million people globally have received this vaccine. By the end of this calendar year, then this number should rise to 600 million. And by the end of 2022, another 1.2 billion. So I'll close with a few perspectives. Uh, vaccine development for COVID-19 has proceeded faster than for any pathogen in history. Safety and public trust is absolutely critical. The Delta variant uh, and potentially future variants are troubling. They can be highly transmissible and there's evidence they can clearly infect vaccinated individuals with waning immunity. New variants will likely continue to emerge in areas of the world with surging infections and low vaccine coverage. So we must maintain a global perspective for this pandemic because any uh, surge in any unvaccinated population anywhere in the world can lead to variants that can then come back and infect the US population. That's what happened with Delta, for example. Therefore, we feel that multiple vaccines need to be deployed as quickly as possible to accelerate the vaccine rollout in the world. So I'm often asked, when will the pandemic end? And of course, I can't answer that any better than any of you. But I do think that it's a race between how fast we can vaccinate the entire uh, world and how fast and how troubling the next set of variants will be. I'll stop there and acknowledge that it really takes a village. Uh, I don't have time to read everyone's names, uh, but um, uh, a, a large number of people led by our group, as well as J&J &J for the NHP studies and multiple academic partners, as well as uh, the clinical program led by J&J &J and the NIH, and we participated in that as well. Uh, and this is a picture of our lab. Unfortunately, this is way out of date. This is from two years ago. Uh, and we were about to get another lab picture this summer, and those plans, uh, we had a window of a couple of weeks where we didn't have to wear masks, and uh, uh, unfortunately, uh, because of the Delta surge, uh, those plans for the picture got canceled, and we hope that with adequate vaccination, uh, we will be able to get to the point where we can take another lab picture again soon. Thank you very much. I'll stop there, and if there's time, take any questions. Thank you, Dan. Thank you, Dan. Um... It's a wonderful talk, and it's obviously you get from another perspective of uh, um, different type of uh, vaccines. I was wondering what your people in your lab get um, as a vaccines, but anyway, that's a that uh, are you get J and J or or Moderna. You know, it was a mixture. Um, it, it it was a mixture actually. I mean, a lot of people. So it, our lab is part of the hospital, so people in the lab were eligible in December and January. Uh, or January and February, very early on, uh, because uh, the hospital lab workers in a hospital were considered healthcare workers also. So a lot of people got the Pfizer and Moderna vaccines as part of the healthcare worker rollout. Uh, I didn't make the rules, but those were the rules. Uh, okay. th then there, was, there were a number of people uh, who joined the different phase three studies, that, including J&J, &J, Pfizer, and Moderna, and got the vaccines in that context as well. Okay, well, uh, but just back to um, 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 scientific questions. And um, Shanlu, the, the previous speaker asked the question, um, what would be the minimal protective neutral antibody title for a vaccine um, to be effective in your point of view? It's a really good question. And the answer is we don't know. There are some um, 
so, so we did a study in non-human primates and in non-human primates, we can do a very clean study because we did an adoptive transfer study. We took neutralizing antibodies. We literally gave different doses of those antibodies. And then we looked and we can actually calculate the neutralizing antibody needed for protection. It was about 50 in our assay. And uh, so pretty low titers. Obviously in, in monkeys, then it's determined by the strain of, vac of virus and the dose of virus you give. So, so within the experimental parameters of the challenge model that we use, the neutralizing antibody titer that gives 50% protection was about a titer of about 50. Uh, I believe it was a titer of about 100 in Peter Gilbert's correlates analysis in the phase three Moderna study. Now, the caveat is that that was pre-Delta. So that was, that was pre-Delta and with a more transmissible virus than it's not proven, but you might expect that you might need a higher titer of antibody to protect against a virus that's intrinsically more transmissible. I don't think that's proven yet, but it's likely to be the case in my opinion. So the short answer is that in the here and now, we're not really sure. So there was another interesting question actually, I want to ask as well and from Tao Liu, and it has been discussed that additional boost might be needed to combat variants and a mixed match of different type of vaccines are being tested. For example, mRNA plus adenovirus um, platforms, which combination in your opinion has the highest benefit over risk? That's a good question. I think the official guidelines are going to be that uh, whatever you got first, you should be boosted with second. And the reason is because that's sort of what, what, what was studied. That being said, um, there's 20 years of research that shows that we, we, we used to call it heterologous prime boost regimens. Now it's been renamed mix and match regimens. Um, that um, uh, since the different vaccine platforms raise different phenotypes of immune response, I see each vaccine almost sampling a different immune space. And if you do the so-called mix and match approach, you might be able to have the best of both worlds. Uh, those studies are actually ongoing. Uh, at BIDMC, we're actually conducting a clinical trial right now uh, in which we're enrolling Pfizer vaccinated people who are at least six months out from their Pfizer vaccine who want to get the J&J &J vaccine. Uh, and uh, we'll be comparing them with people who got J&J &J followed by J&J &J and people who got Pfizer followed by Pfizer. And I think that I think the data is yet to be generated, but in my opinion, there's a reasonable chance that um, mixing different vaccine modalities will give uh, a more breadth of different types of immune responses that might reflect the combination of the two. Well, I, because of time um, limitness, I'm not going to choose two questions, last two questions. One is from Ying Chang. So his question is, is uh, it looks like the breakthrough infection caused a spike of antibody reduction which is normal, but um, was this patient still ill and how serious? Would this observation suggest that antibody titer is not an accurate indicator of the effectiveness of the vaccine? Well, you know, you don't wanna to make too much out of a single case, but um, I can say that it was a very mild infection. So very mildly symptomatic infection. And um, sorry, the other part of the question was, Oh, the antibody titer. So, so actually, interestingly, that individual was the lowest responder. So it's an individual that had an uncharacteristically low neutralizing antibody response uh, following vaccination. So of, of all of that group of 20, it's the, it, it was actually the, the person that had literally the lowest response to the vaccine. Now, again, it's, it's an N of one. You don't want to make too much out of it, but that's that, that's that person. Okay. Well, last question um, from Xiao Qing Wei. Very great work, obviously. Um, I want to ask, do you think, is it possible the booster vaccine induced too high antibodies? It is possible to um, induce some problem, such as monocytes may take up the virus through the antibody-dependent pathways, as mentioned in Dr. Lieberman's talking. You know, Side I don't know if there is, if there's a downside to too high antibodies. Uh, I mean, could it could it eventually lead to immune complex disease or, I mean, I, I think we will, we will so, soon learn about that. 
Um, I wouldn't be too concerned about that, but I do think that if you drive the immune system too far, then you might induce activation and do cell death. And what's not known is from the mRNA vaccines, why is the durability so short? Uh, so, so for both the mRNA vaccines, the responses peak at a very high level, uh, but the, the speed at which there's a sharp decline of those titers, I, I think was uh, a faster than what some people had anticipated. And so what is the biology? Why is that? And I think we don't really know, but it is known that, that if you drive the immune system too hard, then you could induce activation and do cell death of T cells and B cells. And uh, with that, I would like to um, really move on to the last session of today's event, which is the uh, HCLS Annual Distinguished Research Award Ceremony. Um, so this year, we, we received uh, numerous applications from researchers at Harvard Medical School and affiliated institutions. Uh, each candidate was evaluated by our reviewers based on the innovation, significance, and quality of their research. So. Um, in a second, Dr. Xiaoti Ma, the president of HMS CSSA, will announce 10 awardees based on their outstanding scientific contributions. So I would like to switch the stage to Xiaoti. Um, I, would, I would like to congratulate our 10 awardees for receiving the 2021 HCLS Distinguished Research Award. We have five awardees who are participating in this ceremony alive. I will show their award certificate and, and announce their names one by one. And each awardee, please turn on your video and give a brief introduction of yourself. Then we also have five awardees who who are currently in China, but they pre-recorded uh, short videos for us and I will play the video towards the end. Okay, let's get started. The first awardee is, uh, is uh, Dr. Xiao Longli. Dr. Li, please turn on your video. Hi everyone, I'm Xiao Long from Rag Institute. I'm studying energy presentation and T-cell recognition in T-cell immune control of infectious disease and T-cell development. It's my great honor to receive this award, and I will keep my curiosity and passion in immunological research. Thank you. Okay, our next awardee is Dr. Chi Tong Rao. Dr. Rao, please. Uh, hi, uh, so my name is Chi Tong Rao. Uh, I'm a postdoc at Boston Children's Hospital. Um, thank you for this award. Um, it means a lot to my postdoc work and uh, my future scientific career. Thank you. Okay, next awardee is Dr. Jing Yu. Jing Yu, Yu. Dr. Yu, please. Hi, everyone. Um, good afternoon. I'm Jing Yu, a postdoc from Dr. Dan Brooks' lab in BIDMC. And I'm truly honored to receive this award. And I want to thank HMS. Uh, CSSA and thank my advisors, Dan and Shanu, for their great mentorship. And my current interest is to develop vaccines against infectious diseases, including HIV, TB, and more recently, the COVID-19. I'm looking forward to future collaborations. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, next uh, re distinguished research award is presented to Dr. Yongfei Tsai. Dr. Tsai. Hi, yeah. Hi everyone, uh, I'm Yong Fei, good afternoon. So first I'd like to thank HMS CSSA for this special honor and also thanks to the reviewers for recognition of my work. So I'm currently working with Professor Bing Chen at Boston Children's Hospital on the molecular mechanism of viral entry. And my work mainly focuses on HIV-1 SARS-CoV-2 related protein characterization and protein engineering, novel immunity design, and also protein strategy studies. So welcome to contact me if you are interested in my research or have any question. Thank you. Thank you. Our next awardee is Chen Yang Jiang. Uh, please, uh, Chen Yang, please turn on your video. 
Yeah, uh, hello everyone. Uh, I'm Chen Yang. I'm a current second year student uh, at Royal Cornell Medicine. And before joining Cornell, I worked with Dr. Xu Yu and Dr. Matthias Lichtfeld at uh, Reagan Institute of MGH, MIT, and Harvard, and Brigham and Women's Hospital. And my research was focused on decoding viral reservoir landscape in individuals with spontaneous control of HIV1. So um, thank you, uh, HMS uh, CSSA, for the invitation to the symposium. And also, it's a great honor to receive this distinguished research award. And it was truly a team effort. So many thanks to my uh, mentors. She and Matthias, um, they were truly supportive from uh, every way, and also the other two main contributors to this uh, work, uh, Xiao Dong Lian and Charlie Gao, and also uh, our collaborators. I really enjoyed working with all of them. Uh, last but not least, uh, many thanks to the uh, study participants. This study was impossible without any of them, and uh, thank you all in the audience for your attention. Thank you, Chen Yang. Next, we have five another five awardees. Um, they are Dr. Yan Mei Dou, Dr. Shi Yuxia, Dr. Hai Qiang Dai, Dr. Xiao Qing Wang, and Dr. Dr. Yi Li. And they have uh, pre recorded a video, and I'm going to play and see what they are saying. Hi, I'm Yan Mei. I'm very happy and honored to receive the Distinguished Scholar Award from HMS SSA. In the past four years, I have been working as a postdoc research fellow in Howard Medical School with a major focus in molecular mutations in human genomes. Now I have started my own lab of human genomics and computational biology in Westlake University. Looking forward to the new journey. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Xu Yu. I'm a recently graduated PhD student here at Harvard Medical School and Boston Children's Hospital. Here, I studied the biochemistry and structural biology of innate immunity with Professor Hao Wu. I want to thank the Chinese Scholars Association for providing this opportunity and big congratulations to all the awardees on this accomplishment. Thank you. Hello, my name is Hai Chiang Dai. Previously, I was an instructor in Dr. Fred Auslib where I focused on the roles of Lubeck's children in antibody diversification. Now, I have started my new career as a principal investigator at the Shanghai Institute of Biochemistry and Cell Biology. It's my great honor to have this award. Many thanks to HMS, CSSA, community and award committees. Best wishes to all of you. Good morning, everyone. My name is Xiao Qing Wan. I'm a postdoc from Dr. Miles Brown and Shirley Liu's lab at the Farber Cancer Institute. My research is focusing on breast cancer immunotherapy. I'm extremely honored to be receiving Harvard Chinese Life Science Annual Distinguished Research Award. Hope Chinese researchers working at Harvard can make more achievements and HMS CSSA will be getting more contributions to the development of Chinese life science. Thank you very much. Hello everyone, I'm Yi Li. I was a postdoc research fellow at Boston Children's Hospital in Chigang Hu's lab. My postdoc research focused on regeneration, repair, and functional recovery after spinal cord injury. Many thanks to Chigang and CSSA at Harvard Medical School. Okay, thank you again, and congratulations to all the awardees for their great accomplishment. Next, I would like to wrap up this year's symposium by expressing our appreciations to a lot of people. First of all, I would like to thank the Dean of Howard Medical School, Dr. George Daly, for his inspiring, encouraging, and warm-hearted opening remarks. Next, I would like to thank all of our speakers and the moderators for giving fantastic talks and sharing their cut-edge research with us. And I would like to thank our audience for their participation and excellent questions. Finally, I would like to acknowledge our uh, organizing committee. The core, committee co the core organizing committee includes Dr. Qiang Wang, the co-president of HMS, Dr. Dan Liang, the host today, and also uh, the chief of Academ Acad academic division, Dr. Jia Zhili, the chief of uh, publicity division, Dr. Tao, Tao Liu, 
uh, the co-chief of academic division and myself. And also we want to thank the members, uh, Dr. Pei, uh, Wei Kepei, Dr. Wei Wei, Dr. Rong, Rong Qingpan, Dr. Zheng Dongzhao, Dr. Shan Lingke, Dr. Chun uh, Yanren, and Dr. Qi Wang. And also our consulting board mem uh, member, uh, Dr. Hong Yue, uh, for giving all the suggestions and uh, making this uh, great symposium happen. And uh, we will keep on working to organize more events and uh, uh, provide uh, learning and uh, collaboration opportunities for the HMS the uh, uh, Chinese uh, commu uh, research community. And uh, please uh, sub sub subscribe our WeChat account and uh, also the mailing list and uh, stay tuned for the next great events. And also we are going to open recruitment uh, for the uh, organizing uh, members uh, for HMS CSSA. And uh, if you are interested, please don't hesitate to contact us. Thank you. Thank you for, our, for coming.